sort of, sort of talk through a little bit about the process and sort of how I thought about it and just give one example of the kind of things that I both went looking for and sort of stumbled upon. Um, also, I just, I think everybody saw the, the postcards, the data monuments of New York postcards, um, that which uh, Ryan Bradley at, and the folks at Popular Science put together uh, very quickly. I was sort of really excited about kind of beginning to see uh, some of these maps and things built out to the world. Um, so if you say you're writing a book about the physical infrastructure of the internet, uh, almost immediately people say, oh, you mean the tubes, and if you name it the tubes, uh, almost, uh, yeah, next slide, wait. Um, you kind of have to deal with, uh, with this guy, which is uh, Senator Ted Stevens from Alaska, um, the guy who said that the internet is not a truck that you dump something on, it's a series of tubes, which Create something of a stir. He said in 2007, uh, it was on the John Stewart show, you know, many nights in a row. So it was a running joke, and I, uh, and you know, it, it, it seemed as if he was, you know, just didn't get that we'd all moved on. He was sort of stuck in this old way of seeing the world, uh, where the rest of us had kind of have, had, uh, had, had moved on in a, in, a, in a really profound, sort of life-changing way. Um, but obviously, there was sort of some truth to it. Um, you, you, you know, we. We all sort of know the internet must exist in some form or another, um, and yet we completely dismiss this. Uh, instead, the next slide, I mean, the image of the internet, when we try to think of it as a sort of a, a kind of totalizing whole, uh, more often is this one, is of the sort of amorphous blob. Actually, I was thinking yesterday uh, with the, the, the spaceship Earth photo, the sort of the blue marble, that it never occurred to me how much the sort of resonance of this image is similar to, to the resonance of that image of the Earth, uh, that both represent this sort of absolute. Um, in, in, in image of the whole that we don't we don't often understand, um, and for me it was a process of trying to uh, to sort of get past this to try to figure out how to how to sort of get to, to the, the more the more tangible internet, uh, try to find it uh, both physically but also understand it as a whole while also being as specific as possible uh, in its parts uh, and its places. Um, it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, there it sort of becomes a running joke. If you go to the next slide. Um, because you end up with people saying, oh, this is the internet, the next slide, from uh, the IT crowd, uh, the British sitcom, where they trick their coworker that she can really impress the, the bosses by showing, by bringing the internet to sort of show and tell, and the internet is this box. And she, <laughs> she says, um, she says, you know, where are all the wires? And I say, oh, silly, it's wireless. <laughs> and they say, well, it's, you know, isn't it, shouldn't it be heavy? She says, oh, the internet doesn't weigh anything, and that's preposterous. Um, but exactly how we think of it. I mean, you just, you, you don't, for the most part, think of the internet as, as weighing anything. Um, the next slide. Uh, and then there's, I mean, again, these sort of images are everywhere of, this is South Park, uh, when the internet breaks and uh, they, there's no internet to know that there's no internet and they don't know what to do. Uh, and then they, they find the sort of the internet. Um, and they, they fix it by unplugging it and plugging it back in. <laughs> um, which is actually sort of at the highest levels of internet routers is often how they fix it. Um, you know, you have a $500,000 router and an important data center, and, and if, if all else fails, you unplug it and plug it back in. Uh, or you sort of cheat and they have these power supplies that are connected to the internet. And you can sort of pull the plug on the router from far away, and then turn the router back on, and hopefully that fixes it. Fixes it. Uh, so it's it's so yes. I mean, it's not blue. It doesn't look like this. There aren't guys with machine guns um, always. But uh, but this is sort of getting warmer to what the internet is physically in a, in a sort of odd way. Um, and then then you I mean even warmer still. Uh, this is some what are telegeography's maps? Uh, wonderful map. Uh, sort of showing their global internet map 2011. Uh, more as much an infographic as a map, but it begins to thread together the sort of the geography of the Earth as we know it, uh, and um, and the internet as it exists, and in a way that tries to recognize uh, the sort of quantities of flows going through. Um, and they, one of the key things with this map is, that, and one of the key ways that they measure the internet, uh, and map the internet, and, more, and truly one of the key ways that the internet is, works is that it's point to point. Um, that it's, it's all about these links between cities. You have to, you know, any, any at, a sort of, at, a, at the, the basis level, a link is, is between one router and another, and, and the way that, that the telecom industry works, at least, uh, is, is those links are between cities. Um, the, the most highly, heavily trafficked international link, um, as it is the most highly, heavily trafficked international air route, uh, is between New York and London. 
just about to catch the on a real internet. <laughs> Um, so the so the so for me it was a, a sort of telegeography. Uh, definitely those maps were a kind of starting point, um, but uh, but I wanted to to sort of get you uh, more specific about it and try to sort of bring it back to phenomenological terms. I wanted to trust my eyes as much as possible and trust what I could see of it and smell of it and touch and kick and all of that. Um, so you end up uh, uh, so I want to tell sort of one story and uh, Jeff here talk more and tell some more stories, but one story in particular about. Um, a piece of the internet that I, that I, that I visited, uh, somewhat, somewhat accidentally in this case in particular. Um, this is a road in central Oregon, um, in this kind of foothills, eastern foothills of the Cascades. Um, and it's the road from the Dalles, Oregon, to Pineville, Oregon, which I've got a map in the next slide there, uh, which um, are the home, respectively, of the first ground up data centers of the number one and number two uh, visited websites, uh, Google and Facebook. Um, the Dallas uh, got a lot of attention a few years ago. Uh, Google had been very secret about it and started to seep out, and now it's, it's uh, you know, what most people know about it. The front page article from the New York Times, they kind of spoiled the secret uh, in 2008, I think. Um, it's always portrayed as sort of the middle of nowhere. It's not really the middle of nowhere. It's you know, two hours from Portland. It's on Interstate 84. It's like, you know, this is, you know, it's, it's, it's where the, the main railroad alignment is. It's, the, it's sort of the, it's where the, the Oregon Trail stopped on the way west. That's sort of this major infrastructural confluence. Uh, Pineville, which face, where Facebook opened a data center uh, in the spring, um, their first ground building, um, uh, is close to the middle of nowhere. Although even then, not quite. Uh, Bend, the town right next to it, is a, a fancy ski town. You can fly from San Francisco, you know, five times a day. You know, it's not it's not quite as remote as as what you think it might be. Um, but I was driving between them. I was visiting both these places and driving between them. Uh, and started to notice um, on this on the side of the road, uh, I the next um, and this amazing expanse. Nobody on the road. There's snow crunching under my tires. It was like 10 degrees in February, uh, and then uh, and it starts to notice on the side of the road these um, uh, these white posts with orange tops, um, which signify there's a very fiber optic cable, uh, and there you know there's one every sort of hundred yards or something like that. And they came over a hill and came to a spot. I came to sort of this encampment, uh, which is a, a long haul fiber regeneration hub, uh, which was sort of like you know jackpot if you're going off in search of the internet or in order to sort of come, come across this. Um, but the basic idea is that it's you know uh, fiber optic signals light you know light through a tube, and it has to be regenerated every 50 miles or so um, at places like this. Um, what was interesting to me about this one is that I. Uh, in the sciences, level three. Level three is one of the major global internet um, backbone companies. Um, they just bought another one called Global Crossing, so they're even bigger. Uh, and I knew from the folks at Facebook that they were the ones um, that had provided, that were providing Facebook's connectivity. Uh, the sort of basic unit of that is, um, is, a, is, a, is a 10 gigabit wavelength. Um, so they're not actually buying bandwidth, they're buying wavelengths, they're buying light. Uh, and the order of magnitude of light that they're buying is uh, somewhere between 10 and 100 10 gigabit wavelengths. So, uh, say, you know, if there were 80, 80 10 gigabit wavelengths, it's 8 terabits of data uh, per second um, that's sort of plugged into this building, uh, at least theoretically. So I sort of, I, I knew from this plate, I knew what this was, I knew it was a fiber generation hut, I, I knew where it was going, basically, um, and I knew that, um, that, it was, that it was connected to, 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 this, to, to this Facebook data center. Uh, and so, I mean, when I, what that basically means is that if even for a split second, uh, truly a split second, uh, when you are using Facebook, you are touching this place in some form or another. Uh, that this place absolutely exists. Um, that you sort of can't, there's sort of no getting around that. You know, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it passes through, uh, not quite at the speed of light, at two-thirds the speed of light, plus the extra nanoseconds that it takes to sort of pass through the machinery here and be sort of boost along uh, the rest of the way. Um, but unequivocally, uh, th this place is there. Uh, we sort of touch this every day, uh, and, um, and this it's geography is very specific. Uh, of course, that's, um, and it sort of is on the backs of giants in terms of other infrastructure. I, I mean, again, absolutely, I mean, truly in the middle of nowhere. There's you know, no other cars on the road, but across the street uh, is uh, this abandoned AT&T microwave uh, regeneration site uh, that is for sale. It's like you can use it for self storage or something like that. Um, but clearly, this this saddle, um, you know, this hill. Uh, was a good spot for, for micro regeneration. Um, and now is happens to also be the sort of halfway point 
um, between uh, this sort of two classic um, uh, two classic sort of crossroads of prime mill and um, and of the dads. Uh, so that that sort of continues. Uh, as I, I mean, this this is a sort of amazing brutalist bunker. Uh, the the level three encampment looks more like some looks more like something you see behind a gas station. Uh, there's de definitely sort of it's, it's lost some uh, in its in its in, in having gone from being a top a bottom uh, sort of a top down creation of a sort of AT&T in the um, 1950s or 60s to being a sort of bottom up of uh, many different companies sort of building their own networks across the land like level three uh, definitely got a bit more a bit more informal more slides. Uh, so this is this is level three's network map. Um, and I was, um, that, that picture was taken right uh, below Moffin, basically. Uh, the Dallas is up there. Uh, and then you can see uh, the looped prime bill, which Level 3 built for Facebook, basically. Um, and if you go to the next slide, one of the things that's so staggering is there just isn't that much of it. Um, you know, at the, at the backbone level, there just isn't that much internet. Uh, to the point where you can see on this map the little nub that is, um, the little nub that is prime bill. When you talk about crossing the the the, um, the Sierra the Cascades, it only happens a few times. And, and if you if you know that geography a little bit, these are very familiar crossings uh, through the Donner Pass, um, through the the um, whatever that pass is called which is like near uh, near um, uh, near LA. Uh, and so it's not as if you know it's not as if oh there's a lot of fiber in the Pacific Northwest. That's why the data centers are there. Uh, it's a much more uh, sort of limited and specific geography. Um, I mean, even this loop here, uh, Quincy is a very big data center town, one of the other major data center towns uh, in, in the Northwest, and, and that shows up on the map. It's sort of the, the, the national backbone loops around in that way. So, so this is the sort of level that I was operating out of, of trying to go visit these uh, the sort of biggest mines of the internet, trying to be as specific as possible in sort of only trusting what I can see. Um, and as a way of both understanding the whole, but also getting getting down to the parts. Uh, what was there? Uh, so for me, so for me, I mean, this is the image that kind of captures it most. Um, uh, so that, you know, pulled over to the side of the road, you know, this you know, took, took a picture of what uh, and you know, begin to sort of comprehend and, and, and imagine uh, what is passing through beneath here. Uh, you know, a few hundred strands of fiber, each capable of. Uh, transmitting uh, a terabit or north of a terabit of data, probably not all, most definitely not all in use, maybe even a few in use, um, but but most certainly there, and most certainly uh, in this spot on Earth. So. Cool. Yeah, yeah, cool. awesome. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks. So if my computer doesn't keep. Um, let me turn off the. Uh, Energy saver. We're now just going to do some Q and A with Andrew and find out a little bit more about the book and find some more stories that are hit, hidden in the material that he has been unearthing. And um, let me just get this set. Let me go back. So cool. Um, we have so. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely excited to, to read your book, and I think that one of the things that you've been doing quite well uh, uh, is, is uh, in, implying this kind of secret material you know, that you can't talk about yet. And so I'm going to try to chisel away at that and see if we can find some of the kind of um, the secret stories, the, or the quasi-secret stories. But um, I'm just wondering if we could actually just uh, talk, uh, maybe a gesture towards that, and a reference to the data map, um, and talk about where is the internet in New York City. You know, obviously we're using a really bad Wi-Fi connection up here. Um, and there are some really kind of famous buildings around New York that house the internet, or at least house data structure, infrastructure. And I'm just wondering if you could do kind of a, a quick uh, sort of cardiographic survey of, of the internet as it articulates and, and comes to the surface in New York City. Yeah, um, I mean, Barrick Street is definitely a major fiber thoroughfare. Um, it's kind of, I, the, the, the buildings that people talk about at an international scale, um, or, well, I mean, it's, uh, are, are quite limited in the city. Um, uh, 60 Hudson Street and 32 Avenue Americas uh, downtown, 60 Hudson being in the old Western Union building, and 32 Avenue Americas being in the old ATT Long Lines building, building, Long Lines building, um, are um, still the kind of, the, the, the two of the big three, the third being uh, 111 8th Avenue, um, which, uh, which is the old Port Authority building, which, uh, which, which Google bought uh, last year, um, which is sort of a whole other story. Um, but the, um, I mean, certainly, 
there's internet everywhere. Uh, but at a, at a sort of international level, uh, the sort of the, the, the internet's network of networks, the places where networks meet more than any others, uh, are those three buildings. Um, people, network engineers, talk about one of them in eighth, in particular for internet, not for telecom, which is a bit of a sort of strange distinction, um, uh, because the internet sort of rides on top of telecom often. Um, that one of the eighth is one of the, one of the key places. Um, I know, like, uh, I, I have cable vision internet at home, uh, and my connection goes back to uh, cable vision headquarters in Hicksville, Long Island, um, and then it goes back to one of the eighth. Um, and that's one of the sort of key distribution points um, where they connect to you know, dozens or, 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 or um, dozens of networks. Um, and you have to take that very literally. I mean, that means that the cable vision router. Uh, that there's a yellow fiber optic cable plugged into it, and that goes up into the ceiling, uh, goes across the hallway or upstairs or one of the and plugs into the Verizon router or the um, or the Rogers, the Canadian telecommunication router, um, and that's that's very much a physical connection. It's quite transparent where that happens, um, and um, and the uh, and there's sort of no getting no getting around that. Um, so one of the eight and then there's sort of a whole other range of of somewhat secondary buildings, um, but uh, New York having more than most and sort of less concentrated than most. Uh, it's actually kind of a funny thing that in New York, uh, the, it's all old Art Deco buildings in London, it's all brand new sort of high tech looking buildings. Um, so they're sort of, you would expect it to be the opposite. Um, and then the, the connections, um, similarly sort of going out from New York, uh, are, are, are also surprisingly limited. Um, you know, there was, they, they drilled a new, uh, they, they sort of bore a new, Hole under the Hudson um, five six years ago I think uh, beca uh, because of concern uh, that too many too much of the fiber optic connections were going uh, through the through the, the regular tunnels um, so there was a sort of new new hole built especially for communications cables um, which uh, which the sort of you know uh, private equity firm that financed then advertised and it's like oh here's a new you know, here's new fiber across the Hudson um, all in a way sort of making it. Uh, Diversity, security through diversity, um, but yet it's fundamentally can't be hidden because um, uh, because they, they couldn't sell it otherwise. Um, you know, as soon as you scratch the surface, everyone's very eager to tell you where their stuff is um, because it's a, it, the the whole thing sort of depends on these um, on these commercial these commercial uh, codependencies. <clears throat> Um, there's, we, we, we need to have some sort of code system so you can let me know if I'm, if I'm trading on stuff we're not supposed to talk about, but um, the, the manhole story, am I which I ask, can I ask, ask that question or no? It's, no, it says, <laughs> no, no, I can know. No, I, yeah, I mean, there, it's not, I have other questions. No, no, well, you can ask a question. <laughs> what, Jeff, I had one person that said to me someone medicinally, and I actually then backed, I think I told that story almost two years ago, and then I actually backed off from it, and it's not in the book. One person said, you know, there are four manholes in the U.S., and you know if you blow those four manholes, that would be that, and that was hyperbole. Um, you know, it's just Ooh. it's they're actually twelve. No, <laughs> but it's like a, it just it, it's too. I mean, it, it sort of goes without saying. It's sort of obvious that because I mean, sixty Hudson Street is is the is the major landing point for transatlantic cables. Um, you know, I, there are manholes outside sixty Hudson Street that obviously have fiber. I went out one night with guys laying fiber, um, and. Um, a company called Hugo Kane, that are sort of one of the major fiber optic contractors. And working downtown, the degree to which uh, a sort of police car drove by very, you know, with every five minutes, you know, across the street from the, the sort of stock exchange security zone, um, it just it began, the, 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 the degree to which people in the city uh, at night sort of know what's going on on the city streets, know who belongs there, who doesn't. Um, Prove the point that the the more people knew about these things I was asking about, the less concerned they were about security. So, um, so one of the things that you've shown is that uh, there's a the, the geographic presence of the internet, you know, where, where it is, or at least where the cabling is, and where the, where the fiber optics are, and you know, much of that corresponds to things like the Donner Packs. It corresponds to certain valleys, maybe in Oregon, or it even corresponds to certain um, hydroelectric reserves, so that you can put it near a dam and then you can you know power a data center and that kind of thing. Um, but I'm also interested in where the internet then starts having geographic effects and it starts bringing businesses to a certain place where it's trying to get close to a T1 cable or it's trying to get close to that, that story that kind of exploded around the internet about nine months ago about the 
uh, the speed of light trading and how there are ideal places on the earth where you can build a trading hub and some of them are in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. Um, but it would take advantage of light speed trading. So I guess I'm just curious about how the internet works the other way and actually um, seeds geographies on top of itself. Yeah. I mean, the, um, well, I mean, one of the other uh, Manhattan example is uh, the Verizon building, um, the one in the, in the uh, background of every, every picture of the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, three by Pearl Street, that's on the data center map. Uh, the Verizon had basically abandoned, didn't really have much need for it. It was supposed to be turned into, uh, into uh, an office tower, which was reskinned in glass, and instead um, was bought uh, a couple months ago by Safety, a big um, wholesale uh, data center provider. Uh, because there's so much demand for, um, to, for, for data center space um, in Manhattan, because of the proximity to, uh, to the trading platforms and to the banks, um, and that, that geography matters enormously. Um, that it's never, it's not, you know, the real estate price is, 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 is worth it. Um, I mean, the other, the, I mean, the example of, I mean, the, the, the Oregon example is completely fascinating because, um, you know, uh, Google goes through this process of trying to, of, of locating their first round of data center, there are now dozens, but they're their first one, you know, where on earth is it would be the absolute best spot for this? Uh, and they come up through a variety of tax breaks and power and fiber, and there's this interesting sort of substory with the fiber, um, but the, uh, they end up in, in the Dallas. Um, and then um, Microsoft goes through the exact same process uh, like a, a year or so later. Uh, anywhere, you know, where should we put this data center? Uh, and they end up um, 150 miles um, northeast or so in Quincy, Washington. And then Facebook goes through the process three years later. Um, um, anywhere, where should we put it? They end up in the same spot. Uh, but not quite the same spot. I mean, again, it's like they're you know, uh, the Dallas and Prineville are 150 miles apart. Um, what what's in that 150 miles? Um, they're not. They look next door on a map of the U.S., but they're they're very different places. Um, and some of those specifics, uh, the, the, sort of the subtleties of that of, of that location, um, are and a lot of it has to do with, with sort of with sort of taxes. Um, a lot of it has to you know and, uh, and sort of tax breaks. Um, but but then they then that seeds places. And so Quincy now uh, the way the way. Um, what I described it to you was that it was you know, six years ago it was, it was spearmint fields and now it looks like you, know, you, you sort of come into it it looks like um, uh, it looks like a sort of endless uh, you know lots of WalMarts sort of scattered around these huge you know, <coughs> warehouse like buildings um, all of which and then it's like oh now there are lots of air conditioning techs who work in Quincy you know with the industrial area you know, they, they, everybody needs to get their, their chillers fixed and so that those folks are now local um, and all that all that kind of ancillary services to keep. Um, Millions of square feet of data center space going. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the similar story in New York is 60 in the, in the basement of 60 Hudson, uh, and the lobby of 60 Hudson uh, is a, what looks like a hardware store, but it's really a sort of internet supply store. Um, you know, it's like it's got got all of the equipment that you need to keep your your servers and routers um, properly healthy. Yeah. Like a pharmacy on the internet. Yeah, no, it's yeah. One <laughs> wheelchair too. Same thing. I thought I like, read it was a newsstand. And then uh, looked more closely at what they were selling, and they were selling yellow fiber optic chopper cables. Mm -hmm. So, lobby. Yeah. Um, I'll just ask one more question, and then um, I'd love to get some um, questions from the audience if, if there are some. Um, I read one, of, one of the other big stories um, recently was how you know the whole the whole point of the internet right, is that it's it's so uh, redundant. It, it, you can't there could be a nuclear war, and the internet would still be around. And then all of a sudden, Egypt turned it off. Um, so there was this huge thing that was, you know, every time you, every morning I woke up, I found the New York Times, the Atlantic, Wired, everyone, everyone had their own sort of um, forensic analysis of how Egypt removed itself from the internet. Um, I guess I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit about that idea of um, internet localism and how a country like Egypt could in fact secede, as it were, from the internet. Um, how, you know, China can have its own sort of extremely firewalled internet, but is nonetheless knit with the global internet. Um, and then also, I'm just curious about how the U.S. is looking at Tactical, um, almost like enforced internet. So you, oh, you want to get rid of your internet? Well, we're going to fly a drone helicopter over your city, and we're going to force you to have internet because we can bring it to you. I guess I'm just curious about all, all this aspect of that kind of localism. Yeah, the I mean, I, I get what surprised me again and again was how little of the internet there was. Um, you know, so a, a country like you know, um, I don't know, I mean, take uh, take Spain for example. Um, the the sort of vast predominance of Spain's international connections would be through Madrid. You know, it's like it's not as if oh, there's a connection with the border. It's that all of that sort of that sort of backbone traffic, um, similar to the map of the of the request, you know, will go to a, a single telecom hotel, a sort of single building that is a place where networks meet, 
uh, in Madrid or I mean, Egypt knows exactly what happened. And they all met in this, in this one building. And so they, they're, they're definitely come these, these middle points and, and, and choke points. Um, and of course, depending on the, the kind of the government structure, that's either easier or harder to switch off in some form or another. Um, so that look, but that look, but the you know, but the look, the localism is is absolutely key um, in that in that they they there is this short list of buildings in each country that are the that pops the network points of presence, the places where you can you know plug your local network into the international networks in each country, um, and even a place like Hong Kong. Uh, they're like, they, I, I didn't go to Hong Kong. Um, it, it started to get very complicated. Um, but the places that I wanted to see, there were, there were basically two buildings. I was like, oh, you should go to this one, you should go to that one. I called another network engineer and said, well, what should I see in Hong Kong? And they said, oh, you go to this building, you go to that building. And it's like, that's it. Like, that's, that's all there was to it. Mm -hmm. um, so it is surprisingly dense. Mm -hmm. the, the, the story, there was a big story at the Times um, three, four or five months ago, and it was picked up a lot, and I guess well, wired it as well. But about this sort of State Department funded project um, and, and the New America Foundation uh, to do to put these mesh networks um, in, in Afghanistan or um, in Egypt to sort of fly them in, um, and it seemed um, uh, it uh, it frustrated me enormously because it, it missed the sort of basic it, it, it assumed the presence of those buildings I was just talking about um, when in fact that doesn't seem like a given at all. Um, there's this phrase the back call, you know, it's like what? You know, it's like how how do you how do you connect to the, how does your cell phone tower connect to the rest of the internet? You know, how does the, the regional sort of place where ATT gathers together all their, their cell phone things can they connect to the rest of the internet? You know, where do they where do they aggregate and then connect to the rest of the internet in New Jersey, it turns out. Um, but the um, but it's but you can't you know but the notion that you could create a mesh network of any uh, of, of any meaningful bandwidth um, and in a way that's that's uh, that's rich enough to then get back to um, you know get back to one of these hubs and connect international seems sort of you know, bizarre to me. And, I, and I, as I dig deeper into it, you know, one of the key places was um, was uh, in Kenya that they were trying to, to build this, uh, and it was um, and as I sort of got deeper and deeper in the blog um, that was describing the effort and how well the mesh network was working. Uh, it was dependent on a on a on a, um, on a, a safari com cellular connection um, that then connected by satellite, you know, to Virginia. So it was like you know, it's, it, there was always that sort of weak link of the of the of the backhaul, um, regardless of how well you could connect computers locally, which obviously would, would have some help, but, but it's not as if the internet would somehow appear. Yeah. Are there any uh, questions in there? Yeah. So in uh, some of the other kind of municipal or world infrastructures, there are always these instances of, of lost um, structures, like the um, the old subway system over on Atlantic Avenue and Court Street that was just like lost for whatever eight decades or something. Um, and I can see as this technology is like always developing and changing, um, maybe not necessarily lost in terms of where it's located, but the um, the use of the infrastructure. Do you see? There being like kind of uh, lost infrastructure that then gets found or picked up, or is there the potential for that to happen? Yeah, that's sort of the the sort of founding story of 60 Hudson as an internet building. Um, that uh, the um, it was Western Union the Telegraph declined in the 60s. I think six, I think Western uh, Western Union moved out in 67 or somewhere around then. Um, but they kept the rights to their network, um, which in actuality meant the the clay conduits between 60 Hudson and at and um, And when um, MCI uh, was the sort of upstart, you know, uh, uh, telecommunications company in the 80s, fighting, um, fighting, fighting Ma Bell, um, they uh, and, and um, sorry, this gets so some of this gets in the realm of sort of telecom policy, but but it's like they uh, they had to uh, they were with the breakup of the Bell system, they were forced to interconnect um, by, by the courts. So at was t said, uh, you must connect to MCI. And at t said, okay, sure, if you can get here. Um, <laughs> and um, McGowan, the MCI guy, got wind of Western Union's conduits, um, struck a deal to use them. Uh, and as I heard the story told, uh, sort of, you know, metaphorically knocked on the, on the, on the, uh, at, on the street wall at the base of 32 Avenue Americas and said, we're here, let us in. Uh, like, I got it, I got to build it. Um, and that, uh, that, that link, that, I mean, and it was that, that MCI's link 
uh, 60, you know, they put their equipment in 60 huts and they connected it to AT&T and 32 out of Americans. And by virtue of being in 60 huts and all of the other debate and the telco started moving in there. Um, and when all the new uh, fiber optic cables were built in the 90s, they then went there because that was the neutral place compared to uh, 32, which was AT&T's place. So, I mean, the Clay Condu, I mean, that's, I mean, the, the, the New York's most important building, so the Transatlantic Link's most important building uh, is based on that. Um, is based on that initial. So, I'm kind of sure there are other examples, but yeah. Yeah, this might be a little bit philosophical, too philosophical for a question, but, uh, you know, I like that in the talk and in the, the map, he used the term, you know, monuments of the internet. It's interesting to me because, you know, monuments are these embodiments of, you know, the values of a uh, community or values of, you know, some sort of, I'm just wondering kind of, in, in the sites that, that you found most significant, you know, reading them as, as monuments, what did they, you know, did they reveal anything to you about you know, the values of those who use them? Yeah, um, well, a couple ways to think about that. Um, one, I kind of talked about like the, the Gettysburg problem, where it's like Gettysburg is just a bunch of fields. You know, it's like you, you go and there's, there's, you know, there's, there's not much there. You know, it's this sort of hallowed ground, but the, it's, its meaningfulness is applied. You know, it's, it comes from within somehow. Um, certainly, the, the, the you know, fiber optic cable buried here, post on the side of the road, um, is meaningful to me because of the sort of leap of imagination that I apply to it. Uh, and that's the case almost across the board, um, you know, with you know, with almost everything I saw. You know, it's like it requires suddenly for the imagination to see significance in it. Um, the uh, so the but, but I guess the opposite was was true more so. I mean, you, you can't you can't go visit these places in any sort of organized tourist way, um, as, as you know, uh, Ben made this film has uh, been uh, has fairly gone, gone viral the last week about about the. Um, about 60 Hots and other areas as part of your uh, master's thesis at, at, at Parsons, right? Uh, at, yeah, New School. Yeah, New School. Um, but, the, um, but yeah, so there, are, it's, there aren't visitor centers. Um, and actually, uh, I kind of think that there should be, and I kind of think there will be. Um, in Oregon, uh, the, the Bonneville Dam uh, has an amazing, huge visitor center where you get to watch fish climbing up the dam into this place. Um, and it's uh, run by the Army Corps of Engineers. And when you drive, you drive into these huge gates, and there's an armed guard, and they search your trunk, and they say, "Come on in. Um, we'd love to have you." Um, compared to to Google, uh, which pretends not to exist, um, you know, and and, and you know, and uh, it just it's, it's entirely shut down. Um, you know, and, and if you knocked on the door, they would, you know, they would, they would basically there, there's no sign that says it's Google, but they say they're they're about to blow one up. Um, so they're, so it's, they're, I mean, not only are the monuments, but they're they're known as some of you know, f you know forbidden places. Um, but it seems like a matter of months, if not years, before they decide to put a little you know, brewery tour sort of data center window, um, and these become celebrated in some way. It amazes me, same thing that 1118 doesn't have a sort of visitor center. A sort of, you know, I mean, there, if there were a sort of you know, Google House. You know, coffee, you know, cafe and, and fishbowl where you look in, I think it would actually kind of work. Um, so the, the answer to your question is do you value it? You know, they're like, what values do I see in it? And the values I see in it are completely ignoring it. Um, there's no, you know, there's, there's no emphasis on it as a, as a, as a, as a meaningful place. So. Um, maybe we can just wrap up with, um, uh, I, I'm just curious if you, if you saw in your research through speaking to engineers and visiting the sites and um, just talking to people about the future of the internet, if this is a sort of the dinosaur phase where it's the, the mega bodies that have to sort of trundle around and have fiber optic cables and if there's not a more subtle, lace-like sort of, you know, a fulfillment of the metaphor, uh, an ethereal internet on the horizon that will come and do, do away with all this. And then these monuments will just be this kind of archaeology of, of, a, of an earlier phase of, of, of the kind of dinosaur period. Um, I don't know. Well, a couple, a couple of ways to think about that. I mean, one is I kind of, I sort of, I really got to respect uh, internet network engineers. Um, they, they sort of build things really solidly. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, I kind of sort of fell in love with this idea that they're all doing their own thing. Um, but sort of philosophically, it, it, it only works. It only works by the spaces in between. It only works with the connections to other networks. Your network can be the most beautiful thing, but if the network it's connected to isn't equally beautiful and robust, then the whole thing falls apart. Um, 
so I sort of, so I, that's why I like the idea of a disappearance for a shot like that. I'm not really ready for that yet. Um, but the um, but the flip side is um, is one of the, the next big national fiber optic built um, that supposedly has been about to happen for like the last year. Uh, is this company called Ally Fiber, um, and what they're what they what they're doing is is, um, is sort of bridging the gap between these long haul uh, long haul uh, long haul networks where every the fiber doesn't stop. Uh, except for every 50 miles, and then it doesn't even really stop at all because it's not like you can plug into it there because it's uh, both expensive to kind of, to use the metaphor, kind of get off the highway there, and it's complicated to configure, so you can't just kind of plug into the internet there in any, in any, in any reasonable way. Um, but they want to essentially make 60 Hudsons, and actually the guy who sort of developed 60 Hudson, the guy named Hunter Newby, uh, is the guy who's doing Alley Fiber, and his, his metaphor is to, is to build 60 Hudsons along you know, every 50 miles. Um, because that's what is the projections for what a cell phone tower will need, and New York, what a cell phone tower needs now have are so you know a, a tower on the side of a highway between two cities would have a T1 line, which means um, I'm going to tell people during this I'm about to screw this up. Uh, it's like it's like 300 k, it's tiny, um, but or 1.5 k or, or, or 1.5 you know, megs, much slower than probably what your Wi-Fi is here, <laughs> but. The, but the um, but instead it's, instead it's ten gig, so essentially a thousand times more, um, and that's for one tower. Uh, so when you talk about that sort of growth, then um, then you and you have been and you, you talk about building a sort of interconnection point every fifty miles, rather than only in um, only in major cities, uh, then it does start to to get to get to get more um, to you know to, to become more like that that mesh. I actually have one question, which is about um, the the design of you know the buildings that house the internet right now, and so the old art art deco ones in New York, the shiny new ones in London. Like, is there a converging internet housing building architecture? Like, is that happening? Like, the, the only the like only, a typology. The yeah. only thing. That I saw that resembles like a deliberate architectural expression in these buildings was um, was uh, the telehouse complex in London, huh. um, which is uh, East India Key, sort of a little bit west, yeah, east of, of the dock, Canary Wharf for the Docklands, um, exactly on the Prime Meridian, somewhat cosmically. Um, and, and, the, um, and they built, they just built a third building, and the third, and it's you know, it looks like a big steel building and it's got like a pixelated facade it's not it's not bad looking at all it's like the only building that actually like seems to celebrate what it is um, except in the old school way that, that the architecture buildings in New York do yeah. so yeah but the but that's just I mean we got, that was a the, the question is what is the architecture of the internet yeah. it's like mm -hmm. a very finely detailed self-storage warehouse <laughs> because they're strong they're like well-built buildings they're actually kind of nice in their chair way Awesome. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, thanks, Chris.